Good morning. Welcome to Caterham Community Church Sunday morning service. It's so fantastic that you joined us. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Michael. Uh, this is my wife, Lindsay. Hello. And uh, yeah, we are leading the service for you today. Now, it's going to sound a little bit overly holy, but we're going to go with it anyway. Um, we like to start every day um, with some kind of Bible scripture reading. And to do that, we have Bible reading notes. Um, this particular series that we're following uh, is called Jesus Calling. Um, it's actually so good that we're on the second year of doing it. So we've read this year, read this one already around, uh, but it's so good. Um, and when we were preparing for this morning, this one really spoke to us and thought that uh, actually we'd like to share it with you. So Lindsay's going to read it out to you. The book itself is called Jesus Calling, as I say, and it's by Sarah Young. Um, so yeah, if you'd like to just take a moment, um, close your eyes, and if you can, imagine Jesus speaking to you. Come to me and rest in my peace. My face is shining upon you in rays of peace, transcending understanding. Instead of trying to figure things out yourself, you can relax in the presence of one who knows everything. As you lean on me in trusting dependence, you feel peaceful and complete. And this is how I designed you to live in close communion with me. When you're around other people, you tend to cater to their expectations, real or imagined. You try to please them and your awareness of my presence grows dim. Your efforts to win their approval eventually exhaust you and you offer these people dry dry crumbs rather than the living water of my spirit flowing through you. This is not my way for you. Stay in touch with me even during your busiest moments. Let my spirit give you words of grace as you live in the light of my peace. So yeah, I'm just going to pray and um, as we pray um, to start the service, if you're not used to God, um, if you're not used to prayer and you're not used to God speaking back to you, um, uh, just close your eyes and um, as I pray you might find that you get a picture in your mind's eye or you get the line of a song or you get a memory, um, that's all God speaking. Uh, so I just encourage you to um, just be uh, just be quiet, have a have a have a quiet moment, and um, if God speaks to you, uh, speak back to Him and see see how that goes. Um, so yeah, Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much um, for your presence with us this morning, and your presence in every home. Lord, we just ask you to speak to each one of us about your peace. Just release the peace of God to everyone watching this this morning, that you would feel the presence of the Lord where you are. You would feel peace. You would feel joy. We just ask you, Lord, to just bless this service and um, ask that we would learn more about you and more about ourselves as we go through this morning. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, now we've got Will and Seco doing worship for us.
could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living God Who could imagine so great a mercy could fathom such boundless grace. The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declare the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the
Prosecco. Those guys can sing. Yes, they can. And so play the good. guitar. So good. Just so good. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Uh, now, it's time for... Family News. Family News. Family News. <laughs> Um, so thank you so much to everyone who has put an encouragement in um, to the church office. Please keep them coming. We are loving uh, looking at those. Uh, if you've got a scripture or something that God's doing in your life, please encourage other people with it. So um, yeah, contact the church office to do that. Uh, in terms of giving, uh, if you'd like to make a donation to the work of the church, you can do that through the church website, uh, through the donate section, and I believe details will be coming up here in some sort of uh, clever fashion uh, and obviously if you're not a member of the church and uh, you'd like to contribute please do so to your own local church yes we have the romania quiz night coming up soon um, it's always an amazing night uh, hosted by steve bidwell who does just the most fantastic job i think he gets a bit carried away with it but you know steve's just Oh, brilliant um, so let me double check the details yep uh, it's on the 27th of November and it starts at 7 45 uh, obviously it's going to be through zoom uh, the details will be coming out on the church email um, we're looking for donations to go towards that because clearly we're trying to raise funds for the Romania uh, appeal and everything that we're doing with them over there um, so yeah please do get involved and it'll be a tremendously fun night yeah. Uh, we also have a Wednesday church that's ongoing at the moment. We've got a very important series that we're running through. Uh, as the name suggests, that's on a Wednesday and that starts at 7.45 as well. Time. Prayer time. Fantastic. Go on then. Um, so as always, um, we'll give you some prayer points that will come up on the screen. And if you pause the video to pray for those things, that would be amazing. Uh, so this week uh, we are praying for our local Salvation Army uh, and they do a phenomenal job. There's a lot of need around at the moment. Um, so we'll pray for them. Uh, we will be praying for Caterham Food Bank, uh, who we support. Um, and also uh, people who need our prayers are the government. They sure do. They sure do. Um, so w please uh, pause the video while those come up on the screen and let's pray together. Yeah. So that's prayer time. Thank you very much. I always love that little instrumental bit that we have for the prayer time. <laughs> it's fantastic. Uh, right, now it is over to Samara for the children's story. Good morning, children. Today's story that I'm going to read to you is called Abraham's Big Test. In the land of Haran lived a righteous man and with him lived Sarah, his wife. One day the Lord spoke to Abraham saying, I'm going to bless your life. Abraham, the Lord God said, leave your family and country behind. Go to the land I will show you where your numbers will grow in due time. Look to the heavens and tell me how many stars are in the sky. That's how many descendants you will have as generations pass by. I will make your life rich and abundant through you all the earth will be blessed. Your offspring will become a strong nation. With my guidance, you'll meet every test. God came to Abraham one day and said, you will have a son. Sarah heard inside their tent and laughed. It can't be done. But God can do all things. And when a year had passed, he gave Abraham and Sarah their own son at last. God loved Sarah, even though she had laughed, now she had a young son to look after. Abraham named the boy Isaac. He laughs to remind them of their laughter. Many years passed, Isaac grew big and strong. 
Abraham knew his life truly was blessed, but God wanted to know whom Abraham loved the most, so he put Abraham's faith to the test. The Lord said to Abraham, Go up to the mountain and take your son Isaac along, for there you will make a burnt offering to me as you sacrifice Isaac, your son. So Abraham set out for the mountain top, and as he travelled the rocky terrain, Isaac turned to his father, saying, Here is the wood, but where is the lamb to be slain? Abraham answered, God provides well for us. He will give us whatever he can. He could not tell his son that he was the one who would be offered as the sacrificed lamb. Abraham built the altar and laid Isaac down, and as he drew out his knife, the Lord cried out, Abraham, listen to me. Do not hurt the boy, spare his life. There's no need to harm him, God said tenderly. Your faith is as great as can be. Use the ram in the bush for your sacrifice, for you've proven your great love for me. Brilliant, thank you, Samara. Um, now David's going to bring us a word. Uh, it's on spiritual authority, so it's really going to be an interesting one, I think. Um, we're so blessed to have David leading our church because uh, he's got so much experience in this area. Um, he's had some really tough times in the past, so he's really walked through it. Um, and he's been an amazing um, guiding person in the leadership times that I've uh, spent in this church. So, yeah, over to you, David. Welcome, everybody. Well, this week we're going to be talking about spiritual authority in leadership. And next week, Jonathan is going to be looking at uh, the authority of all believers. So let's start with this. Now, Christian spiritual leadership is not an occupation. It's a calling. Leadership in the church is about getting God's people onto God's agenda. Christian leaders serve God first and then others second. Christian leaders create community. So there are four statements I'm making, um, which I believe to be true. But I'd like to look at the authority of the elders. And uh, I'm going to start off with our scripture, our main scripture, which is from 1 Timothy 5, 17 to 22. And it says here that the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honour especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. For scripture says, do not muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it's brought by two or three witnesses. But those elders who are sinning, you need to bring them before you so that the others may take warning. I charge you in the sight of God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels to keep these instructions without partiality and to do nothing out of favouritism. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands and do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourselves pure. So this scripture really helps us understand a bit about what God is saying about our role as leaders. And we can see from this key Bible verse that the elders are to direct the affairs of the church, but they should be honoured and that they can be paid for their work. Now, we need to be careful from the scripture about gossip, about elders, uh, so that nothing can take root in our hearts, uh, unless, of course, it can be substantiated. Make sure that if an elder or leader is able to be challenged before they sin. So it's very important to make sure that you don't end up with a place where um, an elder or a leader can get to such an elevated position that nobody could ever approach them and say, oh, no, you're getting this wrong, or take them aside and that they can listen. Sadly, I have seen those situations happen in some churches. And then it's almost impossible to get out of that place and it can really damage the church. In verse 22, it says, Don't be hasty in the laying on of hands. 
And in this context, this is all about setting people in positions of leadership. So basically it's saying, don't be too quick. Test and make sure that that is okay, that these people are being called by God. Now, in our church, we've developed a system over the years, which we try and put into place when we have people we're inviting into eldership or as a deacon. And what we do is we invite them in. Uh, with the rest of the church knows we do this, but they may not know who we're calling at any particular time. And we trial that for maybe three or six months. Uh, we don't tend to rush these things. And if everybody feels it's right, and what I mean by that is that everybody actually, uh, the elders and the deacons and also the people we're calling, feel it's right before God, then we'll tell the church about that person and then later we'll actually bring them in and say bring it to a church meeting so they can be voted for so that's been working for us and if you're a church leader somewhere else you may find that useful so what about pastors ministers vicars and priests well let's just have a look at what these words really mean and where they come from so the word priest, this originates from the Latin word presbyter, which means in fact an elder. Obviously in the Old Testament it had slightly different uh, implications. The word minister, and this comes again from the Latin, which means less or servant. So you can understand why that word is used. How about the word vicar? So again, this is from the Latin and it means like a substitute or a deputy and a pastor which uh, can mean a shepherd or an elder in the New Testament so these are really helpful uh, ways of describing different types of church leadership and in our church we have elders and deacons and obviously my role as a pastor so let's look at the Bible in a bit more detail to understand the role of an elder. To do that, I'd like to take us to 1 Peter 5, 1 to 4. It says there, To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. It's a really helpful scripture. So Peter here is saying that he is a fellow elder. But not only that, he is also an apostle and equally a shepherd to God's people, to his flock. Now, in my church, my title is actually a pastor. And that's a convenient description so that the majority of people understand the role I have in the church. But I want to tell you that I'm also an elder. So I'm both a sort of a pastor or like a lead elder. And as time has gone by for me, I've also seen my role is changing and I have a slightly different role in which um, I can be like an overseer in which I help maybe other churches a bit. And at times uh, it seems that God is developing like an apostolic role as well. But I'm still an elder. But as I said, Christian leaders create community and creating a leadership team is really important and that's part of my role now it's important to understand when we read through the new testament we see that elders work in groups in a team but in that team each one of those elders may have a different calling a sort of role and, and different gifts a lot of the titles in the New Testament for leaders in the church are in fact interchangeable. And this can cause quite a bit of uh, difficulty when we're looking at these things. 
So there's three Greek words that I'd like to look at. Presbyterus, episkopos, and poimen. And believe it or not, they're all translated as elder or pastor, bishop, shepherd, and overseer. They all come from that root. Now, there is a common calling in each one of those roles, but God equips people to disciple and encourage the church in different ways, and we've all got a part to play. Elders, as you can see from the scripture, can direct or rule, but equally they are servants. Now, most elders, uh, according to the Bible, are meant to be able to teach, but obviously some elders are given special anointing to do various different things. All elders are shepherds, but some have a prominent pastoral gifting. And I know some uh, elders in churches and ministers who actually have amazing gifts in this way. Now, you may have noticed that people don't come out of the womb as spiritual leaders, as pastors and things. They develop, maturing over time. Interestingly, Moses wasn't ready to lead until he was 80 years old. Well, I've got only another 16 years to go. David, who became uh, King David, Jesse's son, was probably only about 15 years old when he was anointed by Samuel. But he didn't become king until he was 30 years old. Now, you need to make sure that you understand that people develop over a period of time. And even though you're called, you may not be ready yet to move into that role. Now, I want to talk a little bit about how not to do it. So if God is calling into leadership and you can check your heart against this scripture. And the scripture I'm going to use is from Ezekiel 34, 1-4. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to you, shepherds of Israel, who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourselves in the wool, and slaughter the choice animals. But you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have not bought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. Wow. So it's good for people in leadership and myself to check our hearts against this particular Bible verse. Now, as I said earlier on, uh, leaders have different giftings. And every leader has a different set of skills. But we've also got weaknesses and various other things going on. Uh, we might have spiritual gifts in a particular way where others maybe not. And they've got things we haven't got. But one of the most important things in leadership is that we are called by God to lead. The thing which I see some churches getting into a model over is thinking everything remains the same. But in fact, nothing is static when it comes to leadership. Things can change. People develop. And I think that's how it should be. And as leaders, we know we've been asked uh, to create an environment to develop leaders. It's one of the things that God has called us to do, is to help develop leaders. In 1 Timothy 5, 17, 22, Paul says this. The elders who direct the affairs of the church, well, are worthy of double honour. So they're worthy of double honour if they do it well. Now, they're only human. And in a church, neither too much respect or too little respect uh, is good. So too much and you can damage the church leader and eventually the church. Too little and the leader will become ineffective and the church is in danger of losing the God-ordained leaders. And again, it all can damage the church. There's a writer who I uh, quite like, and it's a guy called Derek Prince. And he wrote a book called Rediscovering God's Church. And he says, it is natural thing to desire 
position and significance. But it is a dangerous thing to enter into leadership without God's calling. I wonder if you feel called into church leadership. If you do, if you're getting that sort of feeling that maybe that's what God wants, then please speak and pray with others who are discerning. It may take some time, but it may alter your journey so that you can start thinking, what do I need to put in place in my life to enable these things to happen? I want to look at a couple of different types of leader. So the Apostle Peter obviously sees himself as a fellow elder, and you can see that in 1 Peter 5, just as the Apostle John does when you read at the beginning in 3 John 1. So elders have similar responsibilities for oversight and care, but may have different types of role in the church and even international ministries or whatever God calls them to do. In Ephesians 4, 11 to 13, says this, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure, the fullness of Christ. And that's why God gives us leaders to help us on that journey. An elder may display different other gifts as well. You might find that uh, they'll have gifts, uh, say, uh, through the grace of God. And you can read about these in Romans 12, 6 to 8. So it might be prophesying. Um, it might be that actually you have the gift of faith. It might be it is you have the gift of serving. Then you should serve. And if it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then to bring encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. And if it's to lead, do it diligently. And if it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. In verse 8, Paul talks about the gift of leading or leadership. So if amongst an eldership you have someone with the gift of leadership, it would be unwise to ignore this gift. And it might be that in an eldership team or a church team, you might find you've got several people with leadership types of gifts. But often I found that you end up with somebody who is being called to lead amongst them, equal as an elder, but actually called to lead in a particular way. Now, I haven't really had time to sort of speak about deacons uh, and the role that they have. Uh, and I won't go into that now due to a lack of time. But one of the things when uh, looking at elders and deacons, one of the best scriptures to look at, which gives us some real help, is in fact from uh, 1 Timothy 3, uh, 1 to 13. And I'm going to read this because it's a really important scripture. Here is a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, and he must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. And he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders, so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. In the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, 
not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and his household well. And those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. Well, there you have it, the template for elders and deacons, one of some of the very key parts of what we're looking for when we call people to serve in this way. Now, every person is called into leadership in a different way. And we need to be careful that if we want, uh, what we want from a leader, I should say, uh, the things we might expect from a leader. And I, I know when I came to this uh, church nearly 11 years ago now, the way that they went about it was very good. They were very clear about what the church was expecting, what they were looking for, who the, the type of person they were looking for. And one of the things I found to be really sad is when churches have expectations of those in leadership, but have not really had a sort of a good way forward with all of this. And they've found that, in fact, they've appointed people into leadership who aren't really suitable. Or I've even known a church actually tell lies to the person coming in. I remember one church um, who appointed a pastor. And after they started, after the first month, they said, well, I'm sorry, we haven't got any money to pay you. Can you believe that? Uh, so it needs to be honesty on both sides when you're appointing people. 1 Corinthians 12, 27, 28. Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracle workers, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance and of different kinds of tongues. In this list, an elder may have some or all of these gifts, but an apostle will always be an elder. As the word apostle means sent one, and this by implication means that an apostle is sent from a church in which they are part of, an elder of. And often I see things or people put in positions where that isn't necessarily true. So we need to watch what the Bible says. Now, some people like to be in control. They love to be in leadership. And others want to be in leadership to make them feel, themselves feel better about themselves. They need that position. Others genuinely want to serve Christ and his church by being called and equipped by God. A really important scripture I found in leadership is this, from 1 Peter 5 and 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he might lift you up in due time. I'm going to be ending now. And there's quite a bit that I've said, but I want to speak to those. And I want to apologise to those who've been hurt by church leaders. Um, it's possible that I may have hurt you and I want to apologise. So I'm just going to pray for those who may have been hurt by church leaders in the past. So Father God, as a church leader, as an elder, as a pastor, I want to apologise on behalf of those who have actually hurt people in their congregations. In places where they were meant to bring love and reconciliation and help, but instead hurt has come. So Father God, I pray that people be able to forgive those leaders now. Now, the other uh, prayer that I want to just pray is I want to call out the leadership gifts that are growing in people. OK, and it might be even after I've been saying these words, the Holy Spirit has spoken to you and you're just sensing that something's going on. Uh, some of you may be thinking, I don't want that. I, I don't want to be a leader. And I can <laughs> I can understand that feeling. Um, but I want to just bring this out now and call that gift out in you. So, Father God, I pray for those you're calling into leadership of different ways, different types of leadership, maybe elders, maybe different deacons or whatever it is, possibly apostles, whatever it might be, Lord God. I now call out in the name of Jesus those things. 
those things which are hidden, which need to now come out. And I ask, Lord God, through your spirit, you'll release these people into the role that you've called them to since the beginning of time. Come, Lord Jesus, I pray, and build your church, rearrange your church, bring glory to your church, to honour your name. Amen. May the Lord bless you all. Thank you, David. That was really helpful. Yeah, it's really good to understand more of the church structure um, and how we try to do things here at Catering Community Church. Obviously, we're all fallible, um, but we're just trying our best to, to serve God uh, and to serve the church as best we can. Um, and as David said, if something in church uh, leadership or someone in church leadership has hurt you, then please do seek uh, some prayer about that. Obviously, you could contact the church uh, office um, and there'll be people who would be available to pray with you through that. Um, either if it's from our church or another church, we'd like uh, you to be unburdened from that. Um, so, yeah, please do. Great. Thank you. Um, we've just about got time for one last song, so back over to Will and Seco. Precious blood has left me forgiven Pure like the whitest of snow Powerful to make sin and shame retreat this covenant is making me whole So I will rise and lift my head For by His mercy my life was spared The highest name has set me free Because of Jesus my heart is clean Purify my heart in your presence Teach me to discover the joy Of holiness that forms as you draw me close In you what is lost is restored so I will rise and lift my head For by His mercy my life was spared The highest name has set me free Because of Jesus my heart is clean So I will rise For by His mercy my life was spared The highest name has set me free Because of Jesus my heart is clean Because of Jesus my heart is clean because of Jesus, my heart is clean. Oh, thank you guys. That was lovely. Um, yeah, great. Yeah, just awesome. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for clicking onto us, uh, onto the channel and watching this morning. Um, if you've done this as soon as it's been launched, i.e. at 10 o'clock, uh, then you'll be just about ready for the 11.30 Zoom. Uh, we'd love to see you there. If you haven't joined us on Zoom before, then please do. Um, you can get a link through the church office again from that email address. Um, yeah, but it'd be really great to catch up with you. Bring your own coffee and cake. Always good. Hopefully soon we'll be back to having real life coffee and cake together. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm just going to pray and uh, and then we'll close the service. So uh, Heavenly Father, just thank you so much for your presence with us this morning. I pray, Lord, that you have um, spoken to each and every person uh, watching this service. And I bless each of our weeks that we would walk through um, this coming week uh, with the knowledge, in the knowledge of your love for us and with a tangible sense, Lord, of your presence with us as we go through our weeks so that we can um, love you and love one another. Thank you, Lord. Amen.
Amen. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.